As you're turning there tonight, if you could look in chapter 103 and beginning in verse 2, and it simply says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There has been great advancements in medicine and all the time they're coming up with new ways to diagnose things and new ways to give us treatment for things and all of that. And uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I see the commercials for all the medicines that they're pushing. And I think I'd rather have the disorder than I would to have the medicine with all the, the side effects. You know, they say you might have a headache, but to take the medicine, you're going to turn purple and grow a third arm and your ears fall off, but you won't have a headache anymore. And they've got some of these disorders now that have come up that are they're actual disorders, but uh, you, it almost sounds like somebody's made it up. I don't know if you've ever walked into a room and you don't remember why you walked in there. Have you ever done that before? You walked in there and can't remember why you're there. And they actually say that there is a disorder called busy life syndrome. They say some people are so busy, have so much going on, it's just they can't think straight and can't get their minds clear. And so that's why they have a hard time remembering where they've been. And for some of you ladies, if you've got a husband that is retired, and since then, if you have developed asthma or an ulcer or high blood pressure or a rash, you might have what is diagnosed now as retired husband syndrome. It is a real thing. Can you imagine that? There have been ladies diagnosed since their husbands retired with all of these conditions. They say that it is caused by prolonged exposure to your husband. And the only solution is get that guy a hobby. Get him out of the house so your symptoms can subside. But then there is another disorder that's a real one called hyperthymesia. And hyperthymesia was first diagnosed in a woman named Jill Price. Now she is today 57 years old. But um, Jill Price a number of years ago went to the doctor because she could not explain why. But she could remember very vividly every day of her life since February 5th, 1980, she was 14 years old. She could remember every single day, not every detail of every day, but at least some detail of every single day since she was 14 years old. And she went to the doctor. That might sound like a, a nice thing, a good thing to have that kind of a memory. But she went because she said that was not a good thing. She said, not only do I relive every day the memories of all the good things that happened, but she said, I can't stop reliving the memories of all the bad things that happened. So she went to the doctor so they could try to help her learn to forget. Well, tonight in Psalm chapter 103, the scripture says that we should not forget. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I think it's true that so many times as believers, we tend to remember things we should forget and forget things that we should remember. We tend to remember the hurts and we tend to remember the grudges and we tend to remember the mistakes and all those things that Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. And we tend to forget the good things that God has done and forget some of the wonderful blessings in our life. And so David writes this psalm. Now, many of the psalms, as you read, you know that they are directed at an audience. Some of them are directed to the nation, Israel or even some other nations. Some of them directed to certain people. But this psalm, chapter 103, David is talking to himself. He's talking to, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's telling his soul, do not forget all of his benefits. And so here's what he's saying tonight. He says, number one, we should not forget to keep God in our memories. We need to keep God in our memories. Three years ago, there was a man traveling by train in Germany. And they said that he got on the train and he had a bag and he put the bag down next to him and, and the train was going along and they said that when he got off the train that he got off and he forgot that bag. And as soon as he realized he forgot it, he called back to the train station and called to the crew and he said, I left that bag on there. And he said, it's extremely important that you find the bag. They said, what was in it? It was an $11,000 Picasso vase that he was traveling with that he just picked up and he forgot it on the train. They never did find it, and the police said somebody found it, and they realized how valuable it was. And here's what the police said in their interview. They said it was a case of monumental forgetfulness. To think of forgetting something that important, an $11,000 vase on a, on a train. Uh, down in Atlanta, there's a university, and they actually have a, a center that's developed or, or completely devoted to time capsules. It's called the Time Capsule Society. And here's what they say. Around the world, they estimate people have buried 10,000 time capsules, and they remember where 1,000 of them are. They believe that 90% of all the time capsules ever buried have been forgotten, and people don't know where they're at. But Moses, in his five books of writing, says over and over again, remember and do not forget, remember and do not forget. And yet as we go through the scripture, we see that the people were consistently forgetting. They forgot what God had done. They forgot what God had said. That's why God said, build memorials and build altars and, and have uh, celebrations and have holidays and read this scripture so you do not forget the things which I have done and the things which I have said. It is so important to remember what God has done. David writes this, Psalm chapter 103, and 
David goes on and he said he forgives us and he heals us and he redeems us and he does all these wonderful things for us. But there's a reason it's important to remember what God has done. And David showed it in his own life. When he goes that day to see his brothers out on the hillside that are there at battle and his dad said, take this food to your brothers. There's soldiers in the army. Go check on them and see how they're doing. And David goes that day and you remember what he heard? A voice down in the valley, a voice. And he looks down and see the biggest man he's ever seen in his life. And that man down there is defying Israel and defying the God of Israel. And David looks at the king and says, Saul, are you going to let him talk about our people and our God like that? And Saul says, look at him. He's Goliath. He's over nine feet tall. He's so much bigger. He's their champion. None of us can do anything about it. And David says, well, if you're not going to do it, I am. And David grabs his sling and his stones and he starts heading down there. And Saul grabs him by the back of the car and says, have you lost your mind? You're a teenage kid. You're a shepherd. You're not a soldier. This guy's going to eat you up and spit you out. What makes you think you can deal with a giant like this? Do you remember what David said? He said, because I remember one day when I was out with the sheep and a lion came along and tried to devour those sheep, but God gave me the power to kill that lion with my bare hands. And I remember one day when a bear came and he was going to do the same thing and God gave me the power. And the same God that delivered me from that bear and that lion will deliver me from that uncircumcised Philistine. You understand what gave David the strength to go to battle against Goliath was his memories of what God has done. Listen, there may be some Goliaths in our future, but the same God that delivered us in the past is going to go with us into the valleys in the future. And we need to remember that. The God that has done those things in the past does things for us in the future. I've told you before, but... I keep a prayer journal and along with the prayer needs that I pray for, I also keep a list of the miracles that God has done in my life, the prayers that he has answered. And every time I go to pray for something big, I go and I look at that list of all the things God has done. And I look back and say, God did this and God did that. And how many are glad the same Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever? The God that delivered us from the bear and the lion, he's going to go with us to fight the Goliaths of the future. So keep God in our memories. Here's the second thing David said. He said we are also not only to keep God in our memory, but he also said that we are to thank God for his mercy. Psalm 103 is a very unusual psalm in the fact that there is no request made in this psalm. Now, that's an important part of our prayer life. Jesus told us when we pray, pray for our daily bread. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. There's nothing wrong with bringing our needs to the Lord. In fact, he said cast our cares before him. He told us to do that. And David did that many times. He prayed for this, he prayed for that. He prayed for repentance in Psalm 51. He prayed for needs, he prayed for different things. But in this one Psalm, no requests. He doesn't ask God to do anything. He doesn't ask God to provide anything. He doesn't God ask God to heal anything. He just says, I just want to thank God for his mercy. I believe it's important to pray for our needs, but I also believe there comes time when we need just to stop and say, you know, God, I'm not asking for anything else. I just want to say, I thank you and I love you and I just want to spend some time worshiping you. That's what David did. He said, forget not all his benefits. He talks about his mercy throughout this psalm. He said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who fear him. He said, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Mercy is an incredible thing because mercy means you didn't do something that you could have done. Grace is doing something we don't deserve. Mercy is saying we didn't do something we could have done. For example, sometimes when people uh, have done something wrong, they're criminals, they've broken the law, they did what they, you know, you know what they say? They, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. I know what I did was wrong. I know I'm guilty. I know I could get this judgment, this sentence, but I'm asking for mercy. Have you ever thanked God for what he hasn't done? We thank God so many times for what he has done, but have you ever thanked God for what he hasn't done? He said, thank God that he did not judge me according to my sins and my iniquity. Thank God he has not done those things. Mercy is an incredible thing. Mercy simply is a, is a fact that God did not do some of the things that he could have done. You know, when God told them to build the Ark of the Covenant, an incredible thing. He said, build that box and put in that box the Ten Commandments. And he said, above that box, he said, my very presence is going to dwell. And that little holy of holies, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God is going to dwell. But the Ten Commandments remind us that we are failures when it comes to keeping the law. The Ten Commandments remind us that we are sinners. The Ten Commandments tell us that we are sinners who all deserve. The wages of sin is death. But you know what hovers between the, the presence of God and between the Ten Commandments? The lid of the Ark of the Covenant. You know what it was called? The mercy seat. That's what God said. He said, the only way that you sinners can make it to my presence is through the mercy seat. That's what it was. Mercy means that, well, the things that God could have done, but he did not do. 
And so many times people cried for mercy. The Syrophoenician woman, she comes to Jesus with that demon-possessed daughter, and she comes to the Lord. You remember when she said, Lord, have mercy on me and my little girl. And he healed that little girl, even though she said, I know I'm not one of the children of Israel. But even the dogs get the bread that come from the master's table. Another father who also had a demon-possessed son, he comes to Jesus and he said, the demon throws him in the fire and throws him in the water. Have mercy on me, Jesus said. If you've got faith, I've got faith and help thou my unbelief. One day he's coming out of Jericho blind. Bartimaeus cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus healed his eyes. Ten lepers come one day and they say, Lord, have mercy on us. And then there was a tax collector one day standing in the temple. And the publican came, the Pharisee. Do you remember what he said? He said, thank God that I'm not like other people. Thank you, God, I'm not like him. But that tax collector stood afar off and he would not even look up to heaven. He just simply said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so David says, I just want to spend some time thanking God for his mercy. David comes to the end of his life and he looks back. You remember what he said, don't you? Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. He said, thank God for his mercy. This is one reason I think it's so important to remember God's mercy. Because when we remember the mercy we've received, it makes us merciful to other people. You remember Mephibosheth in scripture. Mephibosheth was the son of a prince, the grandson of a king. I was watching a documentary here a while back about a woman and she was descended. She was the granddaughter of the Russian royal family, Tsar Nicholas II. That was he and his family were assassinated years ago there in Russia. They took the Tsar and his wife and his kids and took them down into a basement and shot every one of them and killed them all in cold blood. And she was descended from that family. And even all these years later, she talked about it. Tears were rolling down her face as she talked about this, about her family and being a descendant of the royal family and how they were killed and massacred and all of this. And Mephibosheth was kind of like that. The son of Jonathan, the crown prince, the grandson of Saul, the king of Israel, the very first king of Israel, the George Washington of Israel. Mephibosheth had this important royal lineage, but much like the Tsar, Saul was killed in battle and so was Jonathan. And when the news came to the house that the king and the crown prince had been killed, the nurse grabs Mephibosheth and he runs out of the house, but she trips and falls. Didn't mean to do it, it was an accident, but when she fell, little Mephibosheth fell and he broke both of his legs and they never healed right. And for the rest of his life, he was lame. For the rest of his life, he was handicapped. And now that the changeover has happened, and David is king, and his family has lost their standing, and now they're on the outside, and Mephibosheth is in a place called Lodibar. And he knows that David could do what any other king could have done and probably would have done. David could have said, bring me all the other descendants of Saul so that we can kill them one by one. I want no challenger to the throne. I want to make sure all the other family is gone so that nobody can ever challenge me for the throne. Mephibosheth one day gets a knock on the door and the soldiers come and they say the king is asking for you. I can imagine the terror in Mephibosheth's heart when he says I've been waiting for this day. I knew it was going to come. I knew David would find me and he's going to haul me in there and he's going to kill me and they begin to take him into the city but when he gets there David said Mephibosheth I haven't brought you in here to kill you. He said I brought you in here to make you one of my own. I brought you in here to sit at the table. I brought you in here to celebrate and, and the holidays with us and live in the palace and eat at my table and all these things. And, Mephibosheth, I can only imagine wiping tears from his eyes. Why would you look on a dead dog as I? And David said, it's not because of you, Mephibosheth. He said, it's because of what your father Jonathan did for me. The mercy he showed for me, I want to show for you. Let me ask you tonight, anybody in here ever experienced mercy? Has anybody showed mercy? God has shown us great mercy. And therefore, we should be merciful to others. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. It helps us to be merciful and remember the God that has given us such mercy. So David said, keep God in our memories. He said, not only that, thank God for his mercy. He said, thirdly tonight, serve God in ministry. He said, when we appreciate what God has done for us, he said, we will want to serve others. Now, you know, the disciples, we know a little bit about them. We don't know as much about some of them as we would like. Some, we hardly know anything at all. But one thing I do know about Peter was that he was married. Not because we know anything of his wife, but because we know he has a mother-in-law. You can't have a mother-in-law without having a wife, right? And, and we know that Peter had a mother-in-law, and one day she was very ill and dying. Uh, and part of that was a great fever that she had. And Jesus came in that house, and there laid his mother-in-law, and she was so sick. And Jesus walked in and healed her. And the Bible says that as soon as she was healed, immediately she got up and served. Immediately when she saw what the Lord had done for her, she said, how can I sit here and not get up and serve when he's done all of this for me? Service is a part of our worship. One day Jesus said to Satan, of all, of all people, he said to Satan, he said, listen, we are, we are to worship the Lord our God and serve him. Worship and service go hand in hand. When we worship the Lord, we also serve him and we serve him in our worship. 
And some people think, well, we serve him throughout our lives. But I want you to know, we're not just going to serve him in this life. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, those that are standing around the throne, those who are in robes that have been made white in the blood of the Lamb, serve him continually day and night. Do you know we're still going to serve the Lord for millions and billions of years? Our, our service is going to be part of our worship. And so that's what David said. He said, mercy should motivate us to serve other people in ministry. Let me begin to wrap it up by telling you about the night before Jesus went to the cross. And we call it the Last Supper. It was Passover to them. They celebrated it every year. And, uh, but this particular year, Jesus had plans for it. So he tells Peter and John, go into the city. And, and you're going to see a guy carrying water. And when you do, follow him. And he's going to take you to an upper room. And you're going to set up the Passover there. Has it all set up. And they go that night into that upper room. I don't know what it looked like when they walked up those stairs and walked into that room, but probably nothing fancy, just a, just a regular room somewhere on an upper floor. But they walked in that room and there was the table and there was everything that they would need for the supper. There was the bread and there was the lamb and there were the cups and all the things that they were going to do. But before they went to the supper and before he broke the bread and before they took the fruit of the vine and before he blessed them and, and all those things happened before any of it, Jesus did what nobody else had done. Customarily, when they came into a house, they would have a servant. Somebody would come and wash their feet and anoint their head with oil. It was hot and you know, dry and all that, so they would do that. But nobody had done that. And so Jesus took the bowl of water and the towel, and he got down on his knees. And one by one, he went to them. He went to Peter, who would deny him. He went to Thomas, who would doubt him. He went to Judas, who would betray him. He went one by one to all these, these disciples, not because they were perfect, not even because they were good, but because he loved them. He went and he got on his knees and he began to wash their feet. And now after he was done, here's what he said. He said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus said, I have done this to you so that you would learn and do it to each other. He said, I have done this to you so that you would serve in ministry. And here is David. He says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Don't forget what God has done. Keep him in our memory. Don't forget the mercy that God has had. And if God has touched our lives, then we need to learn from his example and be people of the basin and people of the towel and learn what it is to every day get up and say, Lord, if I have to, I'll get on my knees to serve other people. I'll do whatever I have to do because you have loved me and given me such mercy and grace. And I just want to thank you for that and demonstrate that in serving other people. And so that's what David says tonight. That's what he says. Don't forget. Don't forget all the other things we may forget, but don't forget that. Would you stand tonight and right where you at for just a moment, bow your head and close your eyes. And I know that we so many times come to prayer with a list. We come to prayer and we pray for needs and we pray for people and all of those things are wonderful and it's completely appropriate for us to do that. But sometimes it's also appropriate just to stop and drop on our knees and say, thank you, Lord. No other agenda, no other list, no other demands, no other request, just simply to say, thank you, Lord, to forget not all his benefits. David said, I don't want to forget the one who healed me. I don't want to forget the one that redeemed me. I don't want to forget the one that saved me. I don't want to forget him, his mercy. And as I look back, I see surely goodness and mercy every day and all the days. And when we remember those things, then it doesn't matter how big Goliath might be in front of us. When we remember that the same God who was with us in the sheepfold, the same, the same God that delivered us from the lion and the bear, the same God that was with us yesterday and last year, the same God that's been with us through every storm and every valley, through every battle, will be with us through the coming ones as well. It gives us great encouragement and great strength to remember His promises and His grace and His blessings. Would you come tonight and find a place to drop on your knees and just spend some time saying, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for every good and perfect gift that has come from above. Forget not all His benefits tonight. Just begin to think through them tonight, all the wonderful things God has done in your life.